In the video on the fuel dumps in the forest of Omden, we saw a fuel dump which was just half a mile down that way. And just here by the chapel St. Geneviève, there was a sawmill. Roland Alexander worked in the sawmill, which was just here by the chapel St. Geneviève. He had a Percheron horse to pull his trailer for the logs. They would often go to St. Patrice de Désert to pick up wood. And on the way back, they'd come through Juvigny. And there was a <coughs> short, steep road that went straight up to the village and a longer S road, which was less steep, that also went up to the village and they crossed each other. Now Roland would take the short road and his horse would go on his own up the S road. The horse would get to the village first and stop at the bar to wait for him. He knew the drill. The horse is very, very important in agricultural France at the time. They're also important to the Germans. We often think they were highly mechanized, but many of the troops came in horse-strong wagons and they brought the supplies in horse-strong wagons and they left the same way. On the 4th of July 1943, a bombing raid was organized from southeast of England. 100 bombers were going to bomb a Fokker wool factory near Lyon and 60 bombers are going to bomb a lock, airfield and the railway station near Le Mans. Now the outward journey went okay. They had an escort of Spitfires and Thunderbolts, but these were called back due to the bad weather in England. On the return journey, four B-17s were shot down over southern Normandy. Pilot John Carra ordered the crew to bail out didn't realise about three crew members already had been killed by shrapnel. He met Lieutenant Williams at the door on his way out. Lieutenant Williams was holding his parachute in his arms, which is opened already. Cara told him to jump anyway, but Williams refused. Now on his way down, swinging on his parachute, Cara saw a German fighter coming straight at him, but it didn't fire at him. Now Williams did jump, but left it too late. The plane crashed near this hamlet, just near La Coulanche. This monument was put up to the four crew members, including Lieutenant Williams, who died in the area. It was on this 4th of July that John Carra met Roland. He managed to guide his parachute just enough to avoid high trees, and he landed safely, and then he buried his parachute and his pistol and moved away. Now he found this house, which he thought was a farmhouse, but it was actually the house of Roland. Now he watched the house for seven hours, seeing the comings and goings, to make sure there's no Germans there. Then he approached the house and he was taken in by Roland. He gave him the only spare clothes he had, which was his wedding suit. Then they buried his uniform. Now the Alexander family lived in this house with their nine children, all in one room. It was already crowded, now they had another person in the house. Roland's wife was worried, you'll get a shot. The Germans often posted names of people being shot for resistant activities. And there was a German watchtower just 700 yards away, next to the sawmill at St. Geneviève. So Roland decided to take the American to the Delon house at Gay Bernard, where they used to live when they first got married. All the hamlet was grouped around this athletic American with badly fitting Sunday clothes. If the Germans had come along just then, they would have caught him easily. Carr was exhausted and went to sleep. The Germans were passing on the road. They knew a plane had gone down and parachutes had been seen. Maurice Genny went off to find somebody who would know what to do with the American. During the night, Monsieur Pardieu came to take him across the fields to uh, the Haut de Bois, near La Chapelle d'Andenne, at the Ratu house. Carol was there for over two weeks, hiding in outhouses. The cousin of Madame Ratu took food to him. She was told not to mention the airmen, even to her parents. It was the owner of the Tessie Hotel 
at Tessila Madeleine, to organise his departure. His hotel was full of Germans, and he could get information from them. He could travel around, as he had to get supplies for the Germans, even into the Mayenne department. He arranged a meeting at the bridge over the Mayenne at Coutelm, and the trucker Jusse from Lassay came to meet him, and took him to the gendarmerie in Lassay. So that was a good place to be hidden. Caro finally got to Bern in Switzerland, but he couldn't get back to England from there, so he came back into France. And he was arrested, and then freed again by a raid of the resistance. He finally got into Spain, and from there he got back to England. In 1994, he came to visit the Ratu family. The youngest crew member in the B-17 was William Howell. He'd followed a short training for as a gunner that allowed him to be gunner in the Air Force. He bailed out the back door and landed safely. Now he jumped after Kara had, and he was halfway between Kara and where the plane went down. He was four miles from Kara. He actually landed where Montag was shot down, and we saw his memorial in the video on the storage dumps. Now he'd hid as well as he could, because he heard the Germans coming through the forest with dogs. They'd seen the parachutes coming down. In the evening, he met a charcoal burner who gave him shelter. The charcoal burners were dying out, but the German occupation had given a boost to their occupation. From charcoal, they could make wood gas, which was called gasogen, and that replaced gasoline in cars, because the gasoline was requisitioned by the Germans, and anyway, in very short supply. The next day, Howell went southeast. He passed the fuel dump that we saw in the other video. Then he went through Bagnol de Lon, or past Bagnol de Lon, and through the forest to La Motte Fouquet. He was taken in by a farmer who tended his wounds he got from the shrapnel. Uh, two weeks later, he was at Donfron with André Rougiol, and he met another crew member, McConnell, and some other airmen. They lived a nice life for a few weeks. They would go bathing on Sunday with the local people in the river and have a beer in the Angler's Rest bar with field John Dums on the next table. Now my sources don't tell me how, but they got back to England. But André Rougiol was arrested the next year and he was taken to Buchenwald. It wasn't only Allied airmen that hidden. The Germans used Africans from the French colonies as forced labour in their dumps in the forest. And some Senegalese working near Manoir de Lys, that was their rations depot, they escaped and were taken in by the Ratu. That's where Kara had been sheltered. And some Algerians from the field dumps near the Cerizier crossroads, they escaped and they were taken in by Mr. Jarry at Kutown, who I knew. The first anti-Jewish measure started in 1940. Jews were excluded from the civil service. And then they were forbidden to own businesses. And one measure followed another until 1942. They started the roundups and deportation to concentration camps. The Rudowitz family lived in Belleville, part of Paris. And they nearly got caught in the roundup in July 1942. Madame Rudowitz heard the police coming at the end of the alley, and she went to a neighbour's house and banged on the door and implored her to take her in. And from inside her neighbour's house, she heard the police banging on her door and then broke it down. She never went back to their apartment. She took her children to Coutelm. The four children were housed in three different houses. At least seven houses in Coutelm had Jewish children in them. The postman, Monsieur Vauvard, had Berzin Eisenberg and Jack Barjak living in his house. And just across the road was a German commandant at here. They went to the schools. These, there was a boys' school and a girls' school. In a town of a thousand population, everybody knew everybody, but nobody ever told on them. The priest, Abbe Morel, and the mayor, Dr. Leon Petit, they were collusive in these arrangements. In Peru, there were several Jewish children and women. 
Many of them were taken there by Monsieur Juvencel, who was the stand-in mayor. His wife was a schoolmistress and a town clerk. The Quirtech family lived near the Halle in Paris over their workshop. They left Paris in perhaps 1941. Lillian Kwiatek, who was telling the story, she was just five at the time, she's not sure of the date. They went down south first and then they ended up in Peru. They lived in the orphanage run by nuns and they had false papers with the family name of Caro. Monsieur Kwiatech had left them to go down south to scout the possibilities of getting into the free zone. But he was arrested and sent to Matthausen, but was one of the few survivors to come back. He made a little enterprise of making polish, which he sold to the SS guards and the capo. And he'd exchange it for potato peelings, for which he could make a nourishing meal. So he had more flesh on him than many of the men and he always stood bolt upright if there's an inspection. So he never got chosen to go to the ovens. Once an SS guard found him seeing a clean shirt and he pushed him to the other end of the room, raised up his rifle and fired at him, but he missed. So he just gave him a few blows with his rifle butt and left him. On the 8th of May 1945, which of course was the day the Germans capitulated, the German guards disappeared. So Kwiatek didn't want to wait for the Russians to come and so he led a small band of people out of the camp. There was another Jewish girl in Lydian's class, Agnes Bokar. Now they made a point of not talking to each other so as not to stand out more, but as it was they had long hair. Most of the other orphans had cropped hair to ward off lice. They got so used to not talking to each other that one day after the war they met in a street in Paris and they just said bonjour and passed on. Another family of Peru was a Sapanich called Sapon in Peru. Monsieur Jovincel had actually gone to Paris to bring them to Peru. He was also present in the sale of their house which was false. He wanted to see who bought it which would help them get it back after the war. Madame Sapanich was a very good seamstress and she would make clothes for the local people at Peru and she once even made a wedding dress. People don't always appreciate the danger they're in. The mother superior wanted permission from a German officer to go and fetch some potatoes for their residents. There's over 700, the nuns, the orphans, and there was a, an asylum. Now she couldn't speak German, so she asked Madame Kwiatek to be the interpreter. So she was asking the German for permission. Now her German was interspersed with Yiddish. So the German officer realized that she was Jewish. So what did he do? He went to the town hall, see Madame Juvencel, who was the town clerk, as well as the schoolmistress. He said that Carol were Jewish, they must leave. Madame Juvencel said, no, they're refugees from Cherbourg. He just shouted out, they must leave, and stormed out. So that night, Monsieur Juvencel took them to his mother's house, who was at Chonsacre. They were there when the Americans went through in August 1944. After the war, Madame Kwiatek tried to find that German officer, but had no luck. Monsieur and Madame Juvencel were named as righteous among nations after the war for their work helping Jews. Even though it's 60 miles inland, Kutown saw action on D-Day. A locomotive near the station was strafed and the horse put in a hay wagon was wounded. The next day some dumps in the forest were bombed and Banyal was bombed as well. A bomb fell near the church which caused a crack and it was only repaired recently. On the 23rd, a convoy near the Epinet crossroads was attacked and the station at Coutelm was attacked with P-38s. As the Allies advanced into Normandy, refugees would come through Coutelm, as well as escape prisoners from the forest. They'd be given bread and they'd move on towards Mayenne, 
where bread was easier to find because there were less restrictions in the Mayenne, which is outside Normandy. Farmers had used their hay carts to ferry people to Lassie. In early August, the mayor of Tanchbray, which is west of Flair, was having problems getting rations. So as communications were bad, he decided to actually go to Alençon to get instruction from the prefect. Now the outward journey went okay. They had the young lad sat on the hood of the car with a white flag to ward off fighters. On the way back, they'd just gone through Coutown and a German staff car overtook them just as it was being attacked by a fighter bomber. The, it was the car that took the damage. The lad on the hood was killed and three of the occupants were wounded. Now, Dr. Petit, who was the mayor of Coutown, he tended their wounds before taking them to La Ferte Massey. The Americans had pierced through Avranche beginning of August and they were now coming up from the south, which is behind me. On the 13th of August, the Abbe Garnier, who lived at the Chenny, he went to Ligny, he had to go through Coutel to say his mass. The church tower at Ligny was used by the Germans as a watchtower. They could see over to the forest and looking south they could see across the Mayenne. On the way back he had to cross the bridge on the Mayenne and the Germans stopped him. It took him some time of negotiation to let them let him through and he got back home. Around 1500 hours he saw American troops advancing up the road in single file. He told them the bridge is held by Germans and that the wide junction is also held. It leads them to the Corbury where they can wade across the river. By going down there and they can get to good town. He was then taken to Lassie in a jeep to tell the officers what he'd seen when he went to say his mass at Ligny. Now artillery fire started onto Coutelme, the Americans firing. The house of Marguerite Renault got a shell through the wall. Now some troops crossed the river here and then followed the railway line into town and they could take the Germans at the bridge from the rear. Others went across the river, then through the power station onto the main road and went into Coutelme down the main road from Donfran. By midnight on the 14th, the town centre of Coutelme was secure. In the morning of the 14th, Colonel Wright drove up the drive to Coutelme Chateau, which was met by the Marquis de Frotte, and they set up camp and they used holozone tablets to purify the lake water. The Chateau Champy, which is over that way, that was where the headquarters were set up. Now on the 15th there was a mass in Ligny, a chapel. There's the chapel on the hill. There's the church of the town and the chapel of Ligny on the hill, both in Coutelm, two churches. And in the Chateau of Coutelm, in the evening there was a dance organised because it was Colonel Wright's birthday. Bagnol de Lorne was liberated on the 14th as well. And the generals stayed at the Grand Hotel. <laughs> 